Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next project show. Tim Sample from the Warsaw University of Technology was working on developing a module for the cultivation of plants in a closed cycle in an extreme environment. The students will present their project within the next half an hour, and after that, we will have some time for questions. So please use our YouTube chat to submit your questions and comments, and students will be happy to address them. Now, thank you very much for joining, and I'm happy to give the word to the team. Hello, uh, I am Joanna uh, from Warsaw University of Technology in Poland. And together with Kacper, I would like to talk uh, about our project sample. So imagine the first human, human habitat on the moon. It will be expensive. It uh, will be extremely high tech and it most likely won't be very spacious. Yet plant cultivation, so crucial for a sustainable long-term space mission and for astronauts' nutrition, takes up quite a lot of space, um, even in its most compact forms. Moreover, plants uh, thrive in conditions a bit different to those in which us humans do. These thoughts led us to an idea. Let's design and test a technology which would allow for plant cultivation outside of the human habitat. It would be very simple. A cultivation module is assembled inside the human habitat. Seeds are planted. The module is then sealed and placed outside. The conditions inside the module are perfectly adjusted to the specific plant's requirements. They are monitored and controlled remotely or automatically. After the required time passes, the module can be taken back to the habitat by an astronaut. The crops can be collected. We call the project sample. What does sample stand for? Semi-autonomous modular plant and other life sustaining experiment. Why semi-autonomous? Because astronauts' time and energy are precious, we wanted the project to be as low maintenance as possible. That is why the astronauts only have to be physically engaged with it at the beginning and end of plant's growth. Why modular? Since each organism thrives in slightly different conditions, it seemed sensible to provide exactly those conditions to any species we chose to cultivate. Each module can contain slightly different internal temperature, humidity, nutrients, and modularity also provides a certain redundancy. Multiple plants can be cultivated simultaneously, but if one fails, it doesn't affect the others. Why plants and other life? While plants are an obvious need, there, are, there is no reason why the project can't also house other organisms and bi biological samples. Why experiment? Well, we also treat the project as a possible scientific playground. Because of modularity, it is easy to control which variable is being changed and how it affects the tested organisms. It makes experiments more replicable. Being able to sustain the life of a simpler organism in uh, extreme uh, conditions can also be a stepping stone to sustaining human life. It allows for testing new technologies without the risk. So how did we go about this? We decided on a closed cycle of matter, uh, which you can uh, be familiar with from uh, gardens in a jar. Uh, of course, we also saw some challenges ahead. We predicted that one of the biggest ones would be to protect the module from extreme conditions outside. And now I have a question for the audience and you can answer in the chat and we will uh, give you the answer during the presentation. So the question is, can you guess what other challenges we actually faced? And I'm talking a lot about this we, so now I would like to, uh, I would like us to introduce ourselves in a short video. Hi, I'm Paulina. And I take care of biological design. Along with Justyna, I make sure that plants have enough nutrients, carbon dioxide and water. Hi, I'm Justyna. As part of the biological team, I conducted a lot of experiments. For example, to check if the plants would sprout in a closed cycle, or how sterilization of seeds and substrate uh, affects plant growth. Hi, I'm Pavel. I take care of mechanics. I designed the main structure and made a 3D model. I also manufactured the aluminium frame and walls. My name is Richard and I am responsible for thermal design. I have conducted simulations of how our modules would work at different temperatures and I also proposed some ideas for optimizing thermal performance. I'm Blanka and I designed the user interface. The program I wrote allows gathering data from the module. I'm Mikolai. I'm in charge of electronics, including computer, sensors and camera. I also do the software together with Blanka. 
My name is Kacper and as a team leader I am responsible for team management, work organization and finances and as a member of electronics and software team I am responsible for electronics design. Hello, I am Joanna and together with Kacper I coordinate the project, meaning I make sure everyone knows what and when we have to do. I also stay in touch with the Swiss Space Center and our external partners. And at the beginning of the project, I worked on thermal design as well. Hello everyone, I'm Kacper and I will continue our presentation. Uh, this is on one of first sketches that we had made. It roughly presents the idea that we had at the time. You can see the thick thermal insulation, light and stiff structure from aluminium sealed with O-ring. Inside there is growing medium and all the electronic stuff inside. Because the last Igluna and field campaign took place on a glacier, we knew that our module would need good thermal insulation to function in low temperatures. We went with polyisocyanurate form, which is a bit like styrofoam, but harder and insulates better. We also decided to reverse night and day. Lamps would be on inside the module during the night, when it is colder outside and the extra heat comes in handy. This is how our electronics block diagram had looked like at the beginning. At that time, we had, we had considered solar panels as our main power supply source. Inside the module, there would be sensors and controllers, which would communicate with a control room in the habitat. An astronaut, there would be uh, able to monitor the conditions, regulated automatically, but also change them if necessary. Our system was meant to be based on the creation of closed cycle in the module. For this reason, the model was not allowed to be open before the plants germinate and develop, as this will disrupt water balance and moisture will be released. Closed cycle, which we wanted to obtain, we defined as autonomous system based on biological cycles due to, the, due, due to circulation of carbon dioxide produced by yeast and water placed once in a model, which would circulate between plants, air, and substrate. Needed elements such as nitrogen were supplied by hydroponic fertilizer. We assumed that the yeast would have, con would have consumed the oxygen produced by the plants. We worked evenings and nights after full-time university and for some of us work. We had to secure funds to be able to start prototyping. Luckily, we were financed by, by our university. Even before that, we could start biological tests, which were relatively cheap. We needed to verify our main assumption. Would plants sprout in a closed cycle? Luckily, they did, and they even sprouted faster. We also tested CO2 production in aerobic and anaerobic conditions. It turned out that we have to conduct the experiment in anaerobic conditions, which means without oxygen, because the other way around, the results were much worse and plants didn't germinate properly. In total, we have conducted 10 biological tests. We soon met some challenges and proposed solutions. Throughout the project, we faced several challenges, which had an impact on the final results. One of them was overheating. One of the assumptions that we made at the beginning was that the project test be, will be at Glacier, as it was in the previous edition. Later, it turned out that the location has changed. The temperature of the environment of the new location can vary from minus 5 Celsius degrees up to even 30 degrees, which might have been a serious problem because instead of keeping the right temperature inside the module, we could get even 62 degrees Celsius inside the module. Later, we found solution to this problem, which was a cooling system. The cooling system of the module consisted of mainly three parts, radiators, a Peltier module, and a fan. Peltier's modules were, are devices which allow for heat transfer from one side of the element to the other, depending on the direction of the current. The main idea was, to, was that the Peltier module cools the radiators up to minus 23 degrees of Celsius, and then the fan blows air onto radiators, helping to distribute cold air around. We created and conducted a simulation of our cooling system. The conclusion Richard was that the system may work on it will set temperature inside around 300 kelvins inside, which corresponds to around 27 degrees of Celsius. At the beginning, we thought that we would come up at, with a better idea for sealing than an O-ring because that kind of sealing wouldn't be absolutely airtight. 
it turned out that having an industrial grade custom made sling would be very expensive and we decided that for our prototype is it isn't necessary we went with gum gasket a stripe of rubber which when pressed by the lid would provide us with, with sufficient sealing another ch challenge for us was mold which was appearing during several biological tests mainly because of using unsterilized seeds and substrate as well as high humidity high temperature and high humidity are just perfect environment for mold and we have another question to you. Can you guess how we tried to replace sterilization when COVID-19 broke out and we couldn't access the lab? Can you guess the interesting outcome of the sterilization? Please put your comments on the chat. And here we go so with our final project of our prototype. It was designed to wipe under 50 kilograms with enough water for plants in it. The dimensions are around 60 by 60 by 60 centimeters. The structure is, as mentioned before, made from aluminum profiles and sheets. The gum gasket provides sufficient sealing when squeezed from top and bottom. On the top of the structure, there are protective layers against various factors. The first one is a vapor non-permeable foil. It prevents any water vapor that might have gotten out from the structure from reaching the further layers. The next layer is thermal insulation, a 5 cm thick PIR panel. The layer on top of that is waterproof foil, protecting from rain. The outmost layer is silver foil, protecting from sunlight and preventing from overheating due to heat gains from the sun. On the top of the module, there is cooling element, a chimney with Peltier module. Next, electronics are mounted on the top. They include a computer sensors and camera. There are also air fans inside uh, to allow the better air circulation. There are three LED lamps designed specifically for growing plants and emitting light within the most desired spectrum. Each one of them has 15 watts of power. All these elements are powered from photovoltaic cells and the power is stored in batteries. And of course, the main element of our project are the plants, growing in a medium of cocoa peat substrate a few centimeters thick. The plants chosen finally are lettuce, cress, and spinach, which were chosen because they are grow relatively fast, require small, similar conditions, and are rich in nutrition. As you remember at the beginning, our idea was to create a module that would work on the moon's surface. What is needed to successfully grow plants on the moon? First and foremost, it is an atmosphere. The most important part, atmosphere is protecting a surface of the celestial body from cosmic radiation, and also it has huge impact on the surface temperature as well. For simplification, we can say that the atmosphere keeps the heat inside, and the temperature of the surface does not vary as it does on the moon due to the lack of atmosphere. Then there is soil. Soil has, to, has proper pH. pH is the scale used to describe how much acidic and ba or basic a water-based solution is. Different plants have different requirements, and if the pH of soil will not match with this required by the plant, it simply won't sprout. Proper nutrition has to be provided as well. Soil has, is a major source of nutrients needed by plants to, for growth. The three main nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And there is an light. By using the energy of sunlight, plants can convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates and oxygen in a process called photosynthesis. As photosynthesis requires sunlight, this process only happens during the day. We often like to think of this as plants, breathing in carbon dioxide and breathing out the oxygen. So th this is what would be needed for the moon. But let's remember that we were preparing to first test our prototype during the Luna Field campaign. So we, so we adjusted the design to Earth conditions. What are the differences? Earth's atmosphere helps with heat transfer, but at the same time, the temperature differences aren't that big, slowing the whole transfer. That's why we needed a cooling system in our module to ensure it will not overheat. On the moon, we would experience high temperature differences in the range of minus 100 to plus 100, uh, Celsius degrees and even colder in caves. 
heat transfer there happens through radiation as there is no atmosphere. So a different kind of thermal insulation would have to be used, such as multi-layer insulation. What's more, on Earth, the atmosphere protects us from any kind of cosmic radiation. On the moon, we would be exposed to cosmic and solar radiation. This means that our model would be equipped in some kind of radiation protection. Fortunately for testing on Earth, this was not needed. However, on Earth, we need we need to take into consideration weather phenomena like rain, heavy winds, and snow. And that is something we had to think about our, in our design. So these were our plans. Unfortunately, then COVID-19 pandemic broke out just as we were planning to move into the manufacturing and testing phase. This is an expectation versus reality kind of picture. Unfortunately, because we lost access to our workshop and labs, and also could not work together or secure further funds, we had to give up a lot of our project elements in order to have something finished for the virtual field campaign. You can see on the right mark with color the elements that we were able to manufacture. We had to give up powering from photovoltaic cells and just got power from the grid. We gave up cooling and because of that thermal insulation. We wouldn't need it now because we also wouldn't test the model outside in extreme conditions. Due to the several reasons, we had to give up on this idea, mainly because the lack of experience and knowledge about the power management systems and power reaching towards even. It was not easy to give up on this, mainly it was not easy to give up because it was one of our main objectives of our project. But we did it for the sake of the project. Solar panels were substituted by simply power adapter that we use usually in our laptops. Despite difficulties, we kept working remotely. We held online meetings and everyone did what they could at home. In a short video, which will be on the next slide, you will see how Power Pavel, our mechanics team leader, dealt with lack of access to our workshop. Here. Pavel is manufacturing the module structure in his home garage. He is assembling the frame from aluminium profiles with brackets and screws. Now he's cutting the aluminium sheets. He's being really precise considering he's doing it by hand. These sheets are becoming walls. He's attaching them to the frame with screws. On the edges, he's used ceiling glue. Hello, this is uh, Joanna again, and I will continue. So this is a photo of the finished structure. Uh, other team members worked on other tasks as well. Um, because the module was in a different city than the lamps, the thermal tests were conducted in a cardboard box. We wanted to verify our calculations in reality, at least roughly. We, uh, so we wanted to know, would the lamps really heat up the interior as much as we calculated? The test concluded that in a closed cardboard box, after the temperature stabilized, the interior was over seven degrees Celsius warmer than the exterior. This confirmed our cal calculations and even went a bit beyond because we predicted that it would heat up by about five degrees. Uh, so since due to COVID-19, the designed cooling system couldn't be implemented, uh, further research for an improved cooling system was pursued. The main idea is moving hot air through a channel where it will be cooled down. To make our move, we used simple cooling fans. Same as before, we created a simulation of this cooling system and it looked promising. Uh, so it would allow us to have a steady temperature inside of around 300 Kelvins. And we also couldn't access the biology lab. So we tried sterilizing seeds at home. To answer the second question that we asked you, uh, we tried to do it in a home oven. Unfortunately, this didn't work at all. And actually a, more, a lot more mold appeared uh, now than in our previous tests. Mm. Luckily, we were able to at least work on software and we prepared a user-friendly interface for the control room. It would allow us to see the readings from sensors, download photos from the camera and input some commands. Uh, after some of the restrictions were lifted, we could test sterilization in an auto autoclave, so a specific uh, equipment for that. Surprisingly, even more mold, mold uh, developed. Uh, so we decided not to use sterilization at all because we didn't have a uh, time to experiment anymore. Um, and we were also able to finally work together physically and integrate some of the systems. 
We only had one day together, uh, as some of us had to come from different cities. So let's see what happened in a short video. We started with the structure which Pavel made earlier. With our limited resources, we quickly decided on easy solutions. We mounted the LED lamps and electronics, computer camera sensors. We set up the software to gather data from them. The next day, the biology team put in place the waterproof base on which the soil would be put. So, as you can see, it wasn't perfect, but we made it work without some tools, some materials, access to a workshop and extremely pressed for time. A few days later, we put in the cocoa peat, water, yeast and seeds. They would stay inside for 10 days. We couldn't wait to see the results. Justina from the biology team will tell you all about them in the next video. These are the results of our experiment. Let's go through them together in order to understand them better. The seeds that we planted were from the right cress, lettuce and spinach, which unfortunately wasn't in frame of our camera inside the module. Just after we planted the seeds, we encountered some problems with the software, so we are missing the first few days of data. Uh, this is a manual photo from the first day. When we finally acquired photos from inside the module, the plants have already sprouted. As you can see, and as we feared throughout the experiment, the temperature inside the module was hotter than desired. It was between 28 and 38 degrees Celsius. The humidity reached between 90 and 100% but we are not entirely certain about the sensor's accuracy. The electronics were protected with foil. The pressure was a relatively steady value of around 1010 hectopascals. We collected and measured the plants after 10 days. The worst results we got were for spinach. Only a few of over 50 seeds sprouted. Uh, their height around 2 and 3 cm was way below uh, the 4 cm that we got before after 12 days in a closed box uh, lit with the same LED lamps. Lettuce uh, was not much better, not many seeds sprouted either, although there were a bit more. Uh, the height we got was up to 2 cm against, against 5 cm we got before in a control sample. Cress was our most successful plant, uh, numerous seeds sprouted, the collected plants weighed 6 grams, in our control sample the same amount of seeds would be expected to weigh over 25 grams, uh, the measured height was around 4.5 cm, whereas before after 12 days we got a high of 6 cm. In conclusion, all the plants sprouted but didn't grow as fast as we could have hoped. Cress grew the best. We suspect that the biggest problem was the high temperature and poor air circulation. We hope that after we implement cooling and air fans, which we planned before COVID-19, these problems will be solved. We also observed really high humidity and appearance of a bit of mold. This confirms that we need to experiment with sterilization, maybe with UV. So although the experiment wasn't as successful as we had hoped, uh, we gathered a lot of useful information and we are excited to improve the module. So what is the project's outlook? Uh, a team with new members from our university, also including some of our team members, is applying for Igluna 2021 and they will continue the project. The aim is to take advantage of this year's prototype, improve it, but also use it to test a new idea, terraforming moon soil with the use of geobacter and Chevanel bacteria. To allow for it, some ideas on improvement of cooling are being developed already, as you can see in the top pictures. We have also been accepted to present our project at this year's International Astronautical Congress, which will take place online. So we hope to maybe push it a bit further until then, because it's in September. And at the end, we would like to thank uh, all of the partners, the people who supported us, the supervisors and friends. 
And also we'd like to thank you very much, uh, all of you in the audience for participating in our project show. And now we would be happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very nice presentation. And indeed, I see that we have some questions from the audience. Somebody is asking, what is the state of art of this kind of products? Or is your project is a one of a kind? Uh, so uh, we think that what is uh, interesting about our project is that it's trying to obviously at the cost of some simplification, but we're trying to do it from scratch. So we are questioning of all of the solutions that you may have. So it's an inter uh, everything has to be integrated. And a lot of these projects are very uh, specialized, which is obviously very useful and needed. Um, but for our project, we also would like to, uh, as I told you before, uh, maybe specialize more in the uh, cooling, heating, because that is what we realized that uh, is um, difficult in this kind of a project. And this is something that's also very interesting to develop. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question. Um, how expensive your technology is? Do you plan to have it accessible for the general customer for their home? Well, actually, that is something that we kind of started with. Um, because we started with this idea of it being low tech, uh, because obviously we know that all space tech is like state of the art, top notch technology, but we wanted it to be as um, to save as much resources as, as possible, also uh, including uh, cost. And as you can see, we are now uh, adapting it more to Earth than uh, than the Moon, because obviously, for, as we told you before, for the Moon, we'll have a different kind of thermal insulation. And as you, you can see, we uh, layered the outer layers. So actually, as of now, it could work on Earth. and. Uh, it could be adapted to, to work as a module for the general public. And because, as I said, uh, securing funds was difficult, the cost of our, uh, of our module for now, without some of the um, parts implemented, but we already have it bought, was around uh, two, two and a half thousand euros. And obviously, it's prototyping, so we could make it much cheaper and maybe change the size. Uh, but yeah, it's an open question, but it's something that we definitely thought about, the, the low cost. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. And I have a question related to the design. Would it be possible to make parts of the module transparent and then rely on sunlight during the lunar day in addition to the illumination of the LEDs? Uh, yes, so this is something that we considered, but because the, the lunar day and night are much longer than on the on Earth, we we decided to uh, to not do it. Also, uh, well, actually, there have been some experiments that co that confirmed that you can lengthen the cycle for plants and they would still germinate. I think they were conducted in Russia those experiments. But the, another factor that we uh, took into consideration is that transparent insulation is very expensive. Uh, it's difficult to make. It doesn't has as good uh, Mm, properties for insulating. Uh, so it's something that we considered but decided against because of the cost mainly and because of the uh, length of the lun lunar day and night. Thank you very much. I have more questions as uh, related. Uh, why did you choose the uh, soil cocoa peat? Is the use of cocoa peat viable for space missions in comparison to the hydroponic techniques, for instance, in terms of weight, water use, cost? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so actually cocoa peat is used as one of the mediums in uh, hydroponic uh, cultivation of plants. And cocoa peat, uh, before water is added, has a small volume and is very light. And you can add a uh, little water and it uh, massively changes its volume, so it grows in volume. Uh, so this is something that we tested, I think, as one of our first mediums. And because it works so well, we, we stayed with it but it could be used for, um, for applications uh, on the moon. However, as I told you, we want to next year push the idea of uh, actually treating lunar soil and making it viable for, uh, for plant cultivation. Very interesting, thank you very much. Um, could you tell us a bit more about which plants could currently be grown in your system? 
so uh, the plants that we have tested were, as we've told you, uh, crees, lettuce, and spinach. And <laughs> Uh, as you see, we are still having some problems with that, but uh, generally we were aiming for leaf plants um, because they have similar uh, requirements. Uh, and because it's modular in the future, it would be nice to adapt it to other uh, plants, but uh, for now we're just trying to um, get them to grow properly and leaf plants are the easiest. I see. And now that you mentioned that it's a modular construction, so could you could you tell a bit more about what is the benefits of having it as a modular configuration? Mm -hmm. uh, well, as uh, we've mentioned before, we wanted it to be sort of an experimental test bed for scientists as well. And uh, we really uh, put uh, and an, um, we really wanted it to uh, to make uh, experiments replicable. And we like the idea of, uh, of a uh, scientist being able to fine tune the conditions. So you can do the same thing in a few module and only change one variable. And then you can see precise, you can do it at the same time. So the, so the conditions externally will be the same and you can see precisely which uh, variable affects growth and how. Uh, and as, as we've mentioned, uh, the idea of an external module was also based on the, of the premise that um, each organism uh, requires different conditions. So humans require a bit different conditions to those from plants, and maybe plants don't have to grow in the same environment as humans because uh, obviously making an environment viable for humans is very difficult. And we can transfer uh, this between uh, plant, spe uh, plant species because uh, different plants want different conditions. So if we have modules, then we can do precisely what these plants need in uh, each module. Thank you very much. I have another question from the audience. Will the plants grow the same way in space as on Earth or will they be affected by gravity and radiation? And uh, does your system protect plants from harmful radiation? Uh, okay, so as for the gravity question, there have already been uh, conducted some uh, conducted some experiments on the ISS, International Space Station, and it was found that gravity uh, does have some effect. Like plants can grow without gravity, and their roots uh, just grow against the light source in the opposite direction from the light source. Source uh, lack of gravity changes um, the way that um, the uh, that the roots uh, sort of form their, themselves slightly, but it's been shown that uh, even without gravity, it's possible to, to grow plants. And on the moon, there is some gravity, um, although much uh, less strong than on Earth. As for the um, second part of the question, uh, Maria, sorry, could you remind me the second part? Uh, the second part is about your current project. Have you already thought about um, how in your system you will have the protection from the harmful radiation? Okay, so this is a tricky question because it's something that uh, actually uh, is still sort of open in... Uh, well, it's, uh, it's something that actually there is a problem in all space technologies with. Uh, so as, for, as of now, we don't have... Uh, like we are preparing the prototype for Earth and we've decided that for now we are not uh, shielding from radiation. Uh, also, because these technologies are extremely expensive. However, as a general rule, uh, things that have a, a huge mass are good uh, against radiation. So that's something that also some kind of synthetic like plastics uh, are being developed that are good uh, for that as well. But we don't really have access to that kind of technology right now. So we're not using it. However, if there would be anyone who'd like to collaborate on us and if in the future we had a opportunity to test our idea of Earth, then it obviously would be something that would be it would be very interested in. Thank you very much. Speaking of future and technologies, if you could choose, would you rather see a project sent to the moon or to the Mars? <laughs> uh, well, Mars is further, so it's more exciting, maybe. Uh, however, the moon would be already very nice. Um, yeah, it's um, well. We we've planned it sort of for the moon with with the moon uh, in mind. But the thing is that um, it just uh, the outer layers would have to change, but the internal system 
wouldn't really differ that much. Obviously, the temperatures, radiation, length of day and night would change. But uh, that's also a nice thing about this project that the the main um, extractor, the software, uh, the the things that we put inside can stay the same, and it would just have to adjust the external uh, protection. I see. Thank you very much. Um, you, you were telling us a lot about uh, challenges and uh, troubles you had with the project, but now could you still uh, tell us maybe what is part of the system that you had the most trouble with during this year? So what was the most challenging aspect for you? Well, certainly the fact that we uh, planned for lower temperatures at the beginning was uh, something that sort of stopped us uh, a bit in the middle of the project because we realized that actually the temperatures would be much higher if we, if we would test on Pilatus. And it became clear that we would need some uh, cooling that we hadn't planned for at the beginning. So we also didn't secure funds for that. And it wasn't included in our uh, preliminary project. And I'd like to say that um, we did a lot of documentation because it's the, in the frame of Igluna and it's very, I think useful for us, especially to those people who want to work in the industry later, because we're learning how important documentation is. But also, it um, it has a like big inertia. Once you've put something in the documentation, you've put a lot of work in it. it it's it's a bit different than working, you know, in your uh, dad's garage and just uh, jotting things down on a napkin. You uh, it's a bit harder to change things. Uh, it takes a lot of work. So yeah, the cooling was something that uh, surprised us and we maybe weren't prepared for. Also, it turned out that powering from, uh, well, because of the cooling and because of the lamps, which uh, require 45 watts already, um, we would need more power than we predicted at the beginning. So, uh, and also the power system for the photovoltaic cells um, it's very complex. Uh, we sort of lacked manpower for that. Uh, but I think the story that you can see emerging from this is that we took on a very complex project with a lot of subsystems. And that's something that I uh, talked about before, that other teams are maybe more specialized. But we are trying to do everything. And that uh, obviously costs us uh, in, in terms of uh, specialization and how advanced uh, each of our subsystems is. Indeed. And it's great to see that you were able to complete the project despite all the challenges and difficulties on the way. So congratulations on that. I have another question from the audience. I guess it is related to your future plans. Uh, what were the selection parameters considered for choosing Geobacter and Chivane bacteria? Uh, OK, so actually, this is a, a project, a, a question maybe for the next year's team a bit. But uh, from what I've heard from them, uh, it's that they are pretty easy to access and they are very efficient in uh, in turning harmful uh, some substances, so neutralizing them, uh, in turning them into CO2. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, but that's all I know about this, uh, this uh, matter. Thank you very much. So uh, now I would like to thank again the team for their very nice presentation and for this very interesting discussion. Thank you everyone for submitting the questions. Now we had a chance to learn even more about the project and how to grow plants in the extreme environments. Thank you very much for joining and stay tuned. There is a talk from our, our guests later this afternoon. Thank you very much and goodbye.